Hello, everyone. My name is Reese Lindmark, and you're listening to Gray Mirror, a podcast from MIT Media Lab's Digital Currency Initiative on technology, society, and ethics. And unlike something like Black Mirror, which just looks at the negative impacts of technology on society, we are Gray Mirror, so we look at the positive and negative impacts of technology on society. And please, if you have any feedback, reach out on Twitter. And if you like the show, give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast app. Uh, We really do appreciate it. Thanks. Okay, so in today's episode, I interviewed Tenzin Priyadarshi, and he's a monk, which is cool, which is fun. Monks are fun. Um, and he, or at least he's fun. Uh, and he's the founder and CEO of the Dalai Lama Center for Ethics and Transformative Values at MIT, and also the director of the Ethics Initiative at the MIT Media Lab. And he's connected to lots of Peace Prize winners. There are a lot of them, like six of them on his board, which is sweet. And in this episode, we chat a lot about ethics and Buddhism and more specifically tech ethics. And I just want to highlight kind of two quick things from the conversation. The first is for you, as we're thinking about ethics and for someone like Tenzin, he really concentrates on making sure that those ethics are applied in our actions. And for me, the best way to do that is by concentrating on the words that you use around ethics. And so the two key words are the one that I often use in the past is manifest, where you say, ooh, I have this ethical principle. How is it manifest in my day-to-day life? That's pretty good. And then the one that Tenzin uses a lot is embody, where you say, okay, I have this ethical principle. How am I embodying that ethical principle in, in the day-to-day life? So for you, dear listener, think about this. Think about yourself, your ethics, your principles, and how you're actually embodying them or manifesting this uh, on your, in your day to life. Cool. So then this other piece that Tenzin and I chat about is, I mean, in this tech ethics realm, one of the big questions is how much responsibility do developers have? Can they just put code out there and say, okay, sweet, it's free. Um, And what happens if developers can't do that, if they are worried about putting code out there and it's like, oh, well, law is going to come down and, and get you for doing like bad things or whatever. There's a balance here. And I'm not sure exactly where we fall on this, but I think it's I think it's a crucial tension. So I want to kind of explore that for a quick second here. On one side, you have something like, you know, either permissionless innovation or unstoppable code are the two terms that I often see used here. Permissionless innovation is one that's like the classic, okay, how should you balance innovation versus regulation? If you have too much regulation, then people won't innovate. And, but another piece of this is like in the early internet times, the early internet pioneers loved this idea of letting a thousand flowers bloom, really making sure there's no friction around um creating and, and, and distributing early internet stuff. <laughs> and it was free from government regulation. That was awesome. That empowered the internet to be this awesome new, you know, ground uh, where people, cool new ideas could be incubated. So that's kind of the permissionless innovation. This other one is unstoppable code. And this is one that's often used in the cryptocurrency world. Uh, and this guy, Andreas Antonopoulos, gives this really cool perspective here where he says, hey, if you have unstoppable code, Uh, or rather, if your goal is to disobey unjust laws, one really good way to do that is by creating unstoppable code that when the lawyers or the police come to say, hey, you must shut this down, you say, I'm sorry, I can't, the code is unstoppable, uh, I, I can't shut it down. And that's actually a really powerful way to dis- for coders to disobey unjust laws is by saying, oh, I can't do this rather than, oh, I just won't shut it down. So that's, that's this crucial um, perspective on unstoppable code. But on the other side here of unstoppable code or permissionless innovation is just responsibility, right? Um, what happens if you make code that leads to bad outcomes? Uh, who's responsible for them? Um, and I think that you know developers have a lot of responsibility. If you can put an app out there that impacts 4 billion people with network smartphones out there, you have a lot of responsibility. And so this concept of uh, developers and technologists having fiduciary duty or fiduciary obligations, which means you know a trusted relationship like You know, for example, if I'm buying a house, my real estate agent is my trusted um, fiduciary where they, I trust them to act in my best interests. In a similar way, we can think of developers and technologists as acting in our best interests for humanity here. So I don't know. Uh, This is a difficult tension and and, and one that I'm still working through myself, but uh, Tenzin and I give it a good amount of time in this episode. So I hope you enjoy this episode with Tenzin and I'll see you next week. Goodbye.
Hello, everybody. You're listening to Gray Mirror. Uh, Venerable Tenzin, thanks for being on the show and welcome. Well, it's a delight. Thank you. Yeah, excited to chat here. And we're chatting in person in his office, which is nice, um, <laughs> hanging out here. Um, so I guess, uh, Tenzin, could you just give us a high-level overview on, like, what you do, how you think about ethics, you know, your background, just to get a little bit of texture for our listeners. Um, well, <laughs> I think to simplify my background, I am a monk, uh, a Buddhist <laughs> monk, uh, trained in um, uh, Indo-Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, but I'm also somebody who has a secular studies background, so I did my uh, studies in regular schools and colleges and universities. Uh, I've been at MIT for the past 20 years in, in various capacities. And, um, and about 10 years ago, I founded the Dalai Lama Center for Ethics at MIT. And about five years ago, formally joined the Media Lab uh, and uh, started the Ethics Initiative. Uh, and much of the work is around reimagining ethics in society. Um, uh, I was a bit uh, uh, tired of uh, uh, traditional models around how ethics is taught and how effective it is uh, in terms of uh, people's ability to retain the lessons mm-hmm. uh, that they have learned in classrooms and otherwise. And more importantly, how do they actually apply it in their day-to-day behavior, uh, decision-making and so on. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course, my, my disposition is such overall is that I am interested in aspects of uh, human suffering, human condition, and how we can get out of it, uh, how we can ex- experience a uh, uh, complete sense of freedom and joy and happiness. So that's, uh, that's the aspirational state of things. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's also, I think that's a great... Um, <laughs> It's funny because it's like, oh, could you give me your background? Like, well, I get, yeah, I'm a monk, you know. That's a, that's, and there's so much depth there. But at the same time, it's like, it's, you know, that's a good like TLDR, very quick summary. You know, the funny thing is that a couple of years ago, I was I was giving a series of talk in um, in Asia, and uh, people were trying to point out what my discipline was, mm. uh, you know. And I was in robes, uh, you know, visibly as a monk, speaking at, at these different gatherings, and people were like, well, you know. Uh, he's a physicist, well, he's a social theorist, well, he's a futurist. And I said, you know, these are very confusing labels. Mm-hmm. I think just say that I'm a monk. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> totally, totally. Yeah, that kind of, it's easier, yeah. That's funny. So let's, let's dive into, I mean, in this episode, we're going to talk a little bit about the intersection of tech ethics, a little bit about Buddhism, a little bit about, you know, some of the teaching stuff that you have. But, like, let's dive into that ethical piece at the beginning that you were chatting about there and reimagining ethics. So I guess let's start by saying, like, when you say right now, when you think about the state of ethics you want people to both retain it better and to kind of apply it more. Tell me a little bit more about, about both of those aspects of retaining it and then applying it. So the, the thing is that, you know, historically what we have thought of ethics is mostly around the issue of right and wrong. And the system has gradually been replaced by legal systems. Uh, but increasingly we are also recognizing that what is legal may not be ethical. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to day-to-day decision-making, Um, just the fear of breaking a legal regulation or uh, fear of punitive damage does not necessarily promote human flourishing. It does not necessarily promote the sense of how to be a good human, how to be a good citizen, and so on. Um, And so my initial efforts were simply to expose individuals, uh, especially in the business and financial communities and then uh, people who are in in the tech world, to these kinds of framings and questions and and how is it that they could think deeply and critically about their own uh, decisions and how it impacts society at large. Yeah, I love that. I think that, um, and actually, uh, we're going to chat about this later, but there's a Martin Luther King quote that says, one not only has a legal, but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. And that's kind of exactly what you're talking about. How would one... A, I think I agree with you that we've been living... It, when we think about like ethics and morals, it's like, okay, so as I go through the world, if I abide by the laws, then that's probably good. But as you're saying, we might need to update that and say, no, deeply think from like a first principles perspective about this. When you think about disobeying an unjust law, what kinds of um, you know things would, would say, okay, I should disobey this unjust law? I mean, you know, so historically, as, as you see in... Cases of, for example, South Africa, the United States, uh, uh, discrimination uh, because of color, because of race, 
at some point they were legal. Yeah. Uh, owning slaves were legal. Uh, so it's it's legality of anything is uh, you know accepted by norms of certain times, but it has to be challenged by individuals who believe that it is ultimately not of value yeah. to, to society. Uh, and I think any generation will encounter their own set of unjust laws. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think humans are prone to that. Mm -hmm. And that's why we need ethical framing mm -hmm. that allows us to do that better. Mm -hmm. Yep. So let's talk about the ethical framing perspective for a second. I would say that for me personally, um, I'm at the, at the beginning of my journey with my ethical journey, but I felt personally relatively, I, I think that the effective altruist perspective, which is a consequentialist kind of outcome oriented perspective, um, has been relatively powerful. It says, hey, what, like there's 70 billion land animals, you know, factory farm every year, like we should worry about that. There's, you know, still 750 million people in extreme poverty. Let's think about that. Also maybe the long term future, we should think about that. And so I guess, tell me what are your thoughts on um, something like the effective altruist community, either from an ethical perspective or like the community more generally. What are your thoughts on that framing? So. The, you know, as a as a Buddhist, we deeply think about altruism, yeah, right? yeah, and, and we critically think about altruism mm -hmm. and things. And I think effective altruism is a good movement mm -hmm. in the in the sense that a lack of such movement will leave society in no better place. Mm -hmm. But the challenge is this: the challenge is around the idea that you have a movement and you have embodiment of such movements. Yeah, right? so there are all of all sorts of arguments around, uh, uh, you know, the principles that drive the movement versus individuals who embody that movement. So one of the, one of the challenges that I see is that that effective altruism cannot be practiced simply from a place of anger or mm -hmm. from a place of rage or from a place of complete dissatisfaction. Mm -hmm. That effective altruism has to be rooted in elements of self compassion and compassion towards others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges that I find in, in speaking about ethics is that I believe that uh, it's much more difficult to be ethical. It becomes very easy to become self-righteous. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And oftentimes, even individuals who think that they are being ethical are mostly employing arguments of self-righteousness. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when we enter into self-righteousness mode of things, you sort of inflate the tribal sense and tribal values of uh, who's right and who's wrong and then you stick to it and then you're mm -hmm. defending the argument uh, dogmatically and, mm -hmm. and so on. Yeah. So, so I believe you know that, that the notion of altruism of course from a Buddhist perspective is that there are some tangible goals to altruism mm -hmm. but there are also some aspirational goals mm -hmm. meaning it's not that all aspects of altruism are going to become tangible mm -hmm. in a short scale of time and space. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, but we have to hold that aspiration true. Mm -hmm. And we have to hold that aspiration as a mirror mm -hmm. in terms of how much am I actually evolving rather than just being a spokesperson for mm -hmm. movement. Mm -hmm. How much do I actually embody the movement? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so it sounds like you're, so it sounds like in general you're, gen you think that the principles aren't bad, that like, um, a, just it, it's aligned with you in terms of more people thinking about ethics in general, whether those ethics are good or bad, is a good thing. Um, and then uh, people thinking, and then the effect of altruist principles, you're, you're relatively down with them, but some of the manifestations of them can be negative. And I think that what you're saying about like the ethicalness versus the self-righteousness is super true, and we're going to dive into that in a second. And there's like the tribal nature, which is, I think that effective altruists can get into this as well. It's like, oh, I'm an effective altruist, I'm part of this movement, I'm doing what's best for the world, and you are the other. Yeah, um, yes. and, and I think that that can be negative. Yeah, because again, it, it's, it's an issue of that, you know, we all, effective altruism is not immune to becoming a, uh, an isolated thinking mm -hmm. in some ways and, 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 and it not becoming another tribe, mm -hmm. you know, in some ways. Yeah. And so one of the things to, to deeply reflect on is that how do I minimize tribalism, meaning effective altruism for who? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this is where the Buddhists uh, you know, are, are challenging in some ways because mm -hmm. they are saying that no sentient being should be excluded from my altruistic goals, mm -hmm. should be ex excluded from my altruistic aims, whether they, I disagree with them, whether I dislike them, whether mm -hmm. uh, they don't look like me, they mm -hmm. don't speak the same language, mm -hmm. but they're all objects of my altruistic intentions yeah. and altruistic framing. Yeah. The second part of it is that there has to be some sense of Discipline, compassion, mm -hmm. uh, and that is something that I've been talking a lot about. Also, in in the sense that 
oftentimes, you know, when you look at altruistic acts, most altru- altruistic acts are accidental. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's certain mm-hmm. urge. Mm-hmm. When, you, when you go and interview an individual who's just engaged in an altruistic act, they would say things like, I wasn't thinking about it. Uh-huh. There was something urgent, uh, mm-hmm. urgent about it, and, and mm-hmm. something drove me to do that, mm-hmm. and I didn't. So the thing is that we, we begin to believe that altruism is not rational mm-hmm. because people are not planning on it, they're mm-hmm. not thinking about it. Uh, similarly with compassion and kindness aspects of things that our day-to-day manifestation of it is often a function of our mood mm-hmm. See, that when we feel slightly empathetic towards somebody we try to do that yeah. uh, and and the example that I use often is that uh, you know uh, imagine uh, you know you're walking down Harvard Square and you see a homeless person mm-hmm. uh, and it's a uh, you know it's a cold day but you decide that you're going to grab a cup of coffee and you take it to this homeless person and the homeless person basically takes the coffee, spills it out Mm -hmm. and says, go to hell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wanted a chicken sandwich. Uh Now the issue becomes is how inclined would you be Mm -hmm. to repeat that gesture? Uh Totally. Right. And that's where the discipline part comes in, in terms of what I think should be the driving principle of effective altruism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So that, that discipline piece I think is fascinating and it goes to this this general concept of, of of something that I wanted to touch on with you, which is this balance between so so for example, let's say you go to the, the this homeless person, you say, hey, here's this coffee, and they say, I don't want it, and then you're like, okay, I must be disciplined here, I must be compassionate. Here's another coffee, and they keep doing it, and I do it, and let's say I do it every thirty minutes for you know a year, <laughs> then it's like, oh man, I don't know, Reese, that's no, but maybe, <laughs> maybe they want. Uh, a chai latte. You know, like, you know, so, so, so this is where the Buddhists talk about skillful means uh, slightly, which is that it's not altruism on my terms. Right? Yeah, 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 Meaning yeah. truly understanding and engaging the need mm-hmm. of the other yeah. and then being able to respond to that. Yeah. The, the other part of it is agency, that I may not be the best suitable agent mm-hmm. to intervene mm-hmm. in that scenario. Yeah. So the question becomes, do I find somebody else? Yeah. Or do I want to really have the ego or the pride of I want to be the person who, mm. who does the intervention. Mm. Yeah. So these are sort of framing around discipline, compassion as mm-hmm. to who's the agency, where is it coming from, what yeah. the intention is. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I agree with that. And I, I, I want to kind of go to one level further meta, which yeah. is to say, how do you, so I think both in this, this world of um, some of these like ethical worlds where you're thinking about, oh, should I do this? Should I do yeah. that? What's the balance between ends and means? You get in these, there's a lot of like balances. And what we're talking about now is also a balance of like, how much should you be patient and compassionate versus saying like, you know what, maybe I should move on right. or something. Right. How, and my, my question is a general kind of meta question here about how do you think about, how do you, or let me say one final thing, which is I think, I think that Buddhism also, for my brief um, foray into it, there's a lots of these kind of, there's this question of no self and there's this non-dualism and these kinds of things. So how do you think about just like balance or tensions or dialectics or kind of dances or dualism in general? Like how do you, when you have two ends of a spectrum, how do you work through that? Well, I mean, much of our life and much of human condition is around maintaining the balance and maintaining that tension Mm -hmm. because we have uh, natural propensity to move in either extremes. Mm-hmm. You know, that's why Buddha formulated his teaching as, as the middle path, as mm-hmm. the grounds, that, mm-hmm. that we have very difficult time mm-hmm. being in the middle. Mm-hmm. You see? Uh, and middle is not just you know means of two extremes, it's, it's finding a more nuanced position or finding mm-hmm. a more grounded position mm-hmm. from which you can operate uh, as a person, but where also a sense of growth happens. So it's not avoiding the extremes, it's understanding the extremes mm-hmm. and then recognizing where do I hold the tension. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's, it's the same issue that, that, you know, there are things that are of urgent nature mm-hmm. uh, and there are things that do require a certain amount of patience. Mm-hmm. And so as an individual, uh, you have to make a choice. You have to make a decision, which would you know uh, uh, cater to your sense of urgency. Mm-hmm. But even things that are urgent, you need to sort of deal with it patiently because, mm-hmm. as I said, change does not always happen on our terms. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You see? And when you are talking about systemic changes, yeah. Right? Um, so this is where the thing is that that you know from a Buddhist perspective, part of the discipline is that if you're not patient. So you're driven by a sense of urgency, mm-hmm. and I believe that uh, you know every individual, from Buddhist perspective, who's trying to make change is driven by a sense of urgency. Mm-hmm. We don't want people to suffer more than they have to, longer than they have to. Yeah. But at the same time, if I am not patient, the chances are that 
I have more probability to be frustrated, to mm -hmm. have burnt out syndromes, mm -hmm. um, to get disillusioned with the process itself. Uh, those are the challenges. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, th I think, I mean, you're right to say, I think that's a specific example here of like the urgency versus the patience. I think, and what I would say is, or something that I think can be difficult for people is, um, and I related to this this perspective of there's modernism, which is like the world tells us what to do, and then right. there's postmodernism, which right. is like nothing is true, and then there's like meta modernism, which is like <laughs> thinking about all the world, saying okay, right. let's of all these different perspectives, I'm going to choose one right now or whatever. So right. how do you think about given this kind of framing of when you have, have these two poles and you're always ha dealing with two poles or whatever, right. how do you create coherence? How do you think about creating coherence and a coherent like way to, to move forward given all these tensions and dialect? That's, that's a great question. So, so I think one thing to understand is that coherence does not imply certitude. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Coherence yeah. does not always imply stability. Mm -hmm. so coherence simply implied, implies a greater understanding mm -hmm. of the process mm -hmm. and a greater understanding of what the trajectory, what the arc is going to be. Uh, the, the dilemma is that we seek artificially mm -hmm. uh, a sense of stability mm -hmm. see, that goes against the nature of the world. Mm -hmm. see. Uh, if we were able to have the resilient quality of embracing uncertainty, mm -hmm. see, I think we'd be better off mm -hmm. uh, in that way. Now we can have momentary certitude of things. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, but you know, the, 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 the characteristic of this world is how they say uh, uh, VUCA, is it? volatile, uncertain, oh. ambiguous, right? Mm, nice. that's, that's, that's the characteristic of, of, of the world that we're living in. Mm -hmm. And so you have to train your mind yeah. to embrace those characteristics and say, how do I persevere through this? Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. And I think that um, I especially agree with the idea that coherence does not necessarily mean you have 100% certainty. It's like, look, you're just, it, it's more of a clarity of your own like trajectory for the next period of time or something like that. Right. Not just like an overall, oh, I know everything. Right. Um, so let's, let's kind of stay on this like Buddhist train for just a quick second longer. And, and as before, before Tins and I got on, we were chatting about meditation. I just, I was proud of myself because I went on my first like three day meditation retreat and Tins does it every weekend. So it was, um, and I, I was asking him what his meditation practice is, and he says, Hey, I kind of, you know, I need it for, you know, to, to you said something like, or if I didn't do it, it'd be an occupational hazard or something. <laughs> Something like that. So tell me about like why, and I'm also reminded of um, this guy who wrote Sapiens, you know, Yuval Noah Harari, who said for him he does lots of meditation as a way to, he thinks of it as like tech is like trying to understand him and he's trying to understand himself before tech can understand him. So tell me about how you think about meditation and why it's important for your daily life or everybody's daily life perhaps. I, I think, uh, you know, I mean, there are different reasons why people meditate. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, I think in modern society or, or the world that we live in, Awful times people meditate simply to maintain sanity, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, because of their day-to-day uh, uh, -day sort of overwhelming uh, uh, tendencies uh, mm -hmm. with technology, with relationships, with interactions, yeah. and so on. Uh, uh, however, you know, uh, if you're doing it for a period of time that I am doing it for, uh, you sort of move away from this reactive. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, sanity seeking meditation framework mm -hmm. you're looking at meditation more in terms of gaining deeper sense of clarity mm -hmm. both about yourself and about the world mm -hmm. and that's an that's an incremental mm -hmm. uh, process and you're trying to sort of also engage in uh, by virtue of gaining clarity into uh, and things like virtue cultivation mm -hmm. uh, in terms of understanding you know which part of your behavioral disposition should not be manifested more often mm -hmm. in, 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 in society. How mm -hmm. do you regulate that? Mm -hmm. um, so the, it's it's an increasing sort of forte in, in, in self awareness. Mm -hmm. um, uh, at the same time, understanding deeper sort of the nature of the world, the nature of reality, the nature of others. Uh, 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 you know, and silence is a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you mm -hmm. know, we fear that a lot, mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes I have to remind people that mm -hmm. you know. We have forgotten to mm -hmm. spend quality time with our own mind. Mm -hmm. uh, we always use a medium, mm -hmm. uh, internet, television, social yeah. media. Uh, you know, we do things with our mind, but we never sort of just sit down with our mind and say, mind, you have been there for a long time. <laughs> let's get to know each other. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's understand each other. Yeah. Um, and and uh, initially, meditation is 
simply that. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I think that there's, I, just, I definitely agree with the initial piece of, for some people just to maintain sanity. And I'm kind of, I, I'm luckily like very, like pretty emotionally stable. And so, but I know for other people at this meditation retreat, they were experiencing deep kind of like, Emo- and like, and for me, I'm also not too like triggered by the world, or whatever. And like, I'm, uh, so, uh, it, but I think for a lot of people, like yeah, that first piece of just being like, whoa, what happens when there's the world occurs, and then what is my reaction to that? And then, as you say, the second piece is that clarity piece. I think, um, and I and I'm reminded of you got especially starting with yourself first. I think is so powerful, and just being like how understanding your lens and, and how your mind works is crucial for then understanding how the world works. Uh, and then I also think that third piece about just silence being good. I agree. It's like, there's, I think it's just very helpful for people to do kind of categorically different things. And when you go and when you're meditating, it is so different than all the other things that you do in your life, which have noise around them, which have mediums that are not just purely your mind. Um, and, and even just for doing something that's categorically different, just different for different sake is almost nice. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, and, and, and I think, uh, you know, uh, we need more experience of stillness. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, again, stillness is not certitude, mm-hmm. but it's a form of stability that we're all lacking. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it, it, it does yield to a certain form of groundedness mm-hmm. uh, that I think is good mm-hmm. for uh, our species yeah nice yeah yeah i agree i agree like an underlying foundation that yes. you can all say so i would i would say i'm pretty bullish on meditation and i think that it's a very powerful thing and like and like of i don't again i don't know that much about the different religions but like buddhism more generally the fact that it always takes this kind of multi you know this dynamic perspective on things um i think <laughs> again that's a that's a that's a vast generalization but what are the my the question i'm getting to here is what are the negatives to to something like meditation or you know something like this this mindset? Um, yeah. Well, so so let me let me frame it this way. I mean, the first thing is to understand that you know I would like to think when I'm looking studying Buddhist texts or looking at Buddhist practices that there are certain things that are not about Buddhism per se. It's just about factual aspects of life. Mm-hmm. Meaning, you know, so you take things like change or mm-hmm. impermanence that is highlighted in Buddhist philosophy or Buddhist learning and how to deal with it and so on. It's not a Buddhist concept. Mm -hmm. Meaning that just because you're not a Buddhist doesn't imply you don't experience change or impermanence or Mm -hmm. death or or anything of that. Meaning so these are factual aspects Mm -hmm. of our day-to-day experience Mm -hmm. that uh, the Buddhists have tried to shed some insight on how to sort of work through it, how to cope with it, how to embrace it in some ways. I think that the negative aspects of, of meditation is, again, that uh, you can go extreme in any mm-hmm. direction. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, you know, Buddha himself was very, uh, 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 sort of very, very deep thinker, but always reminded people of moderation mm-hmm. as, a, as, a, as a key to things. Yeah. And, and my challenge, like yesterday, you know, we had this conversation uh, with a rabbi friend of mine and uh, uh, a colleague from one of the Zen monasteries in Tokyo to talk about Shabbat and mindfulness. Mm-hmm. And, and it was one of those things where we started talking about the, you know, that everything takes a popular route some mm-hmm. days. And so you have this thing where meditation mm-hmm. has become, uh, you know, part of the pop culture mm-hmm. uh, psychology. And, and, and the thing to ask is, you know, what is it actually contributing to? Mm-hmm. Uh, is it useful in the long run? Mm-hmm. Is it good in the long run? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so so there, you know, intention is is a key thing of why am I meditating? Mm-hmm. So knowing that mm-hmm. is, is useful. And then having proper sort of, I think, guidance or guidelines around how to go about it is, mm-hmm. is, is uh, of tremendous importance. Yeah. Otherwise, chances are that we start encountering some of these negative aspects yeah. of, uh, associated with meditating. meditating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I think there's, um, A, I super agree on, in a very classic response here, the don't be too extreme, yeah. you know, like everything in moderation, yeah. even moderation. Yeah. Uh, and then I think that there's also, yeah, the other piece of like, if you're, as something that's more popular, just to make sure that you're that you are not doing the clickbait version of it, but yeah. rather trying to, to, to do it, right. making sure you you know you're you're self-aware of your intentions and right. are doing it in a good way. So, do you think? I'd like to transition now to 
you're chatting about like um, technology and tech mm-hmm. ethics, and it's something that uh, I think is interesting because there are many, I don't know how many, but a good amount of many monks in the world and, and that think about, and many people who think about ethics, but only some have kind of gone down this path that you've gone down of like thinking more deeply about tech and tech ethics. So could you guys tell me more about what was your first like um, kind of you know catalyst for you jumping down the kind of tech ethics route and how you're thinking about it these days? So I, I think the the initial instigator was a simple recognition that uh, uh, there are certain forms of technology uh, that are evolutionary in nature and they are going to simply become more and more part of the human fabric. Mm-hmm. Um, in the sense that it was not going to be a choice anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, I grew up in a generation where we still thought of technology as a choice, and mm-hmm. there will always this kind of uh, sentiment that if someday technology falls in disarray, we can go back mm-hmm. uh, in mm-hmm. time and sort of be in this utopia where uh, technology is not going to be part of our life. Yeah. I think we increasingly we are recognizing that that is not true, but at the same time. Uh, we should not simply blindly follow aspects of techno optimism, Mm -hmm. which is that, you know, that society would be just better off with with more and more technology, Mm -hmm. meaning the question of meaningfulness or purposefulness uh, is still crucial in in this direction. Um, And then, you know, just insights around what happens when technology or a platform doesn't do what it was designed to do? Mm -hmm. Are people thinking of uh, you know, unintended consequences, mm-hmm. or even if people know of consequences, are they ignoring it? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, a classic example uh, for me has been um, uh, social media mm-hmm. uh, as, as as one of the platforms, which is that you know, um, even f- six, seven years ago, I was raising this issue with colleagues mm-hmm. that you know, social media is not necessarily doing what they think mm-hmm. it is doing in terms of bringing people together Mm -hmm. and connecting, that it is actually increasing this tribal behavior. Mm -hmm. And people are simply seeking, uh, you know, based on interest groups. But people do not have a refined sense of interest. Yes. Uh, And uh, and it's it's a different kind of validation and it will add to a different kind of propulsion in some ways um, uh, in, in, in the world that we live in. And the second aspect of it was also looking at short and long term behavioral changes that mm-hmm. were happening to us. So for example, things like patients. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, uh, I grew up in a generation that was still used to postal services. You wrote a letter, you waited for two months and you got a response and you were happy you got a response. Mm-hmm. And you drafted another letter and you sent it out and so on. Um, uh, growing up in India, we did not have voicemails. Mm-hmm. So you called, if you got the person, that's fine. If you didn't get them, that's fine. <laughs> and you, you, you called again. Uh, but you know, 20 years fast forward, you're living in a world where if people don't get a response in 30 minutes, there are self-doubts that mm-hmm. are created, that mm-hmm. did I send them the right mm-hmm. message, uh, mm-hmm. is the person pissed at me, mm-hmm. uh, you know, how do I get hold of them? And so you see that there are behavioral shifts mm-hmm. uh, that are happening in individuals, and you ask yourself what the what the macro of this is going to look like mm-hmm. uh, in, 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 in civic society. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the, the challenge was that most people, again, confuse ethics and compliance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, people would say, oh, we have a team that deals with compliance mm-hmm. and we have a chief compliance officer. Mm-hmm. But the whole notion of compliance, again, going back to aspects of legality and ethics, yeah, exactly. is it? is that you know you design a product you deploy it and if something goes wrong with it the compliance officer or, or the team kicks in and then they try to solve the the, the, the matter but the damage is done yeah. and when you talk about emergent scalable technologies yeah. the damage could be yeah. too vast yeah. before we even catch it yeah. Anyway. Yeah. so one of the requests the urges or encouragement that that I was trying to uh, uh, give to my colleagues in, in, in the tech world mm-hmm. was that why don't we begin to think of ethics itself as an optimization framework which yeah. is that let's not think of ethical implications after the product is deployed mm-hmm. but look at it in the design mm-hmm. um, uh, uh, process of things yeah. and that perhaps ethics will be an ally that will actually help us design better products if we take those perspectives into consideration yeah 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 I like that. I think there's 
Yeah, there's a lot there. I think that the, I mean, and I agree with the ethics as um, an optimization framework thing. I actually think that there's, uh, I don't think we need to dive too deep into this right now, but I think that the cryptocurrency world has that kind of baked into it in a weird way where they're trying to redesign all the things. And as part of that, they're, as they're start, and they're also, they're kind of a response to Google, Amazon, Facebook, Web 2.0 stuff. So they're like saying, okay, how can we make a world that based off the incentives that we're setting up, it is likely to lead to more powerful ethical emergent outcomes. Sure. So that's, uh, hopefully there's, there's some of that there. And I think that, yes. It, and I want to actually dive in though to, there's this concept though and this tension that I want to get your take on, which is there are, as people and as technologists have as you say, there's these scalable. Um, if you can press a like, you know, press a button that goes to four billion network smartphones worldwide. Um, how should individual technologists and developers start thinking about? On one side, there's like they should be super responsible and held responsible for their actions. It's like the fiduciary obligation. Yeah. And on the other side, there's like, okay, we love permissionless inter- innovation. Like the internet itself was like, you know, built on this world where it could be very permissionless and whatever. Um, and in the crypto world, there's like this concept of unstoppable code. And how, so how do you think about the balance between the responsibility of things versus just like permissionless, let it be free? So, so that's the thing. Uh, that's a very good framing of, of, of your question. I, I, you know, I don't believe that permissionless and being responsible are mutually exclusive. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, in the sense that, you know, you ask yourself, who is it that you're seeking permission from? Mm-hmm. Uh, and why is it that you're seeking permission from? Mm-hmm. And if you're truly seeking permission with the sense that, that your product is actually going to um, create something better or interject something better in, in the life of uh, civic population or, 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 or individuals, uh, it helps you deeply think about, well, what are the permissions that I'm seeking? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, and it, it helps you deeply think about the sense of responsibility. So even beginning with an attitude of non-harming mm-hmm. uh, is, is a useful attitude that, you know, am I working on something that is going to be harmful mm-hmm. uh, uh, to a certain subset of the population? And is that a collateral that I'm willing to live with? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you know, how do I rationalize it? How do I process that? Uh, itself and then the second aspect of it is that you know am I caught up in my own narrative mm-hmm. of how this thing is going to be beneficial mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and this is I think one of the challenges that we are seeing more and more is that people are not critical enough of their own narratives mm-hmm. that we simply buy the story that we weave mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and I think that's detrimental mm-hmm. to, to human growth and human progress yeah yeah that makes sense I think that there's yeah, I think that they can not. Well, I, I want to dive in on that for just a quick second longer. The 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 fact that they're not mutually exclusive. I guess that the way that a lot of people might say it is something like, "Hey, um, I technology is neutral," or like, you know, I produce the things and it's used by people, and I didn't control have any control over that. Right, right. You know, I, I think that's that's. Uh Logical fallacy, uh-huh. yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and this is a logical fallacy in the sense that you know, there's a very interesting thing about human behavior, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, when you do something great and you get recognized, or your tool gets recognized, everybody wants to jump up and say, "It was me! It was me! I did it!" Mm-hmm. Uh, if something really goes wrong, we want to blame something else. We mm-hmm. want to blame. Uh, other agencies, algorithms, mm-hmm. and, and so on yeah. and so forth. Right? So there's something about you know uh, taking credit versus staying away from uh, blame mm-hmm. uh, uh, yeah. that is you know baked into our our, our psyche, <laughs> and, and and we need to become uh, aware of that. Yeah. The the thing is that and this is where I, I want to move away from the traditional discourse on ethics as opposed to ethics as optimization. Mm-hmm. The traditional discourse on ethics has been that scientific community or design community often thinks that ethics is a hindrance. Mm -hmm. It's an obstacle Mm -hmm. to raise those kinds of questions to scientific Mm -hmm. development. Mm -hmm. Here, what I'm proposing that it is not. Mm -hmm. uh, That in fact, raising those kinds of questions can precisely help us Mm -hmm. frame better experimentation and better design Mm -hmm. uh, thinking. Uh, Because you have to again ask yourself, who is it truly beneficial for? Mm -hmm. If that is going to be your argument. Uh, otherwise, you know, the world is filled with all sorts of crazy lunatics mm-hmm. and they don't need permission. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, but again, this is the thing that, you know, permissionless should not be romanticized mm-hmm. to the extent that we become irresponsible. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I, and I think that 
And I wish you luck on your journey with saying ethics <laughs> as optimization, trying to bake that into the system and getting companies to believe that that is because when they're just focused on ROI and you know making money, it's like oh man, that. It's, uh, yeah. That's why I said it's a, it's a, it's a it's a systems thinking challenge. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Uh, you know, we have to, you know, because the thing is, you look at the alternate. What is the alternate? Mm-hmm. Which is that, you know, you look at the most pressing issues. Mm-hmm like climate change. Mm-hmm. It's about survival of the planet yeah. and we're polarized about yeah. it. Why are we polarized about it? Mm-hmm. Because we don't really understand our return of investments. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because our priorities are set in a, in a, in a, in a certain direction. Yeah. So that's what, you know, in the, in the absence of ethical framing, this is what happens, mm-hmm. which is that people will have more polarized conversations mm-hmm. uh, with the self-righteous groups yeah. rather than trying to actually figure out what would actually work. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So let's kind of transition to our, our final piece here, which is thinking about teaching and, and how you th- how you teach um, these guys. And you've, you've taught for a while, both here at MIT and also around the world, um, and trying to get people to kind of level up their, their ethical framework. Tell, I mean, how... So pretend that you're some random person in the world, whether it's me or some one of my, my listeners. How how would you how do you think about teaching and getting people to kind of move along the path towards um, better ethical towards a more ethical life, essentially? So I steer away from the idea of teaching ethics. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay. Nice. You reject the question. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Uh, there, there are two reasons. I think you know teaching implies that. Uh, you know that there is a very sort of uh, straightforward model mm-hmm. to, to kind of thing. So you know, uh, generally when we can teach ethical arguments, we mm-hmm. can teach about history of ethics and sociology of ethics mm-hmm. and so on, but not necessarily how it primes decision making. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there are sub- certain subset of tools that you try to impart in mm-hmm. this this process of ethical learning, mm-hmm. and part of it is. Uh, around critical reflections. Mm-hmm. Uh, part of it is around uh, awareness in terms of even understanding what's priming your decisions. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you arrive at your core values? How do you actually arrive at what are the, what are your values? Mm-hmm. Where did they come from? Do you ever thought about, did you ever think about it or just their societal norms or norms from your parents or your heritage or your tribe? Mm-hmm. And that's why you think it's true and so on. Because again, teaching ethics has the challenge that you'll make an individual self-righteous. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Rather than giving them the tools that you need to even question your ethical framing. The, the other part of it is recognizing that we live in an increasingly complex environment. Mm-hmm. It's very difficult to come to absolute right of things. Mm-hmm. Isn't it? So you have to impart the understanding of value trade-offs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That people need to really understand that that in complex decision making, mm-hmm. we have to, to the best of our ability, understand what is the cost to me and what is the cost to civic society mm-hmm. if I act mm-hmm. out of this value versus that value. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I think these are some of the tools that we start with um, in, in, uh, uh, in this process. But more importantly, one of the things that, of course, I'm, I'm trying to suggest is that if people have a certain ethical framing around their lives, uh, they will live a more fulfilled life. Mm-hmm. That, 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 that there will be more proximity to this ever evasive sense of happiness and joy and purpose, mm-hmm. which I think is, again, something that defines our species mm-hmm. in some regard. Yeah, I agree. I think that there's. Yeah, once you once you start to go down the path of ethical stuff, then you start to it has positive emergent behavior around like your own happiness and meaning making right. and things like that. Um, and just and as just to reflect a little bit of that, a um, yeah, think about your own um, it, think about your own journey with ethics and say, hey, are the things that I believe did I was I socialized into them or did I, how did I come to them? Right. Understanding that process, being aware of that, and then also being aware of like okay, if I'm trying to be more ethical, what are the parts of me that are also doing the self-righteousness and being like, oh, now I'm a great ethical person. Hey, world, check me out. Um, and then finally, yeah, as you're going through, knowing that whatever your current state of being is in, in this complex world, whatever your, sorry, your current like you know values are, right. you're going to have to make trade-offs and being aware of how to think about those trade-offs. Right. And, and, and the, the other challenge is that you know we are all, especially in literate societies and educated mm-hmm. societies, we are all very well familiar with the vocabulary. Mm-hmm. So it's not just about, you know, if you ask people in a room, mm-hmm. are you a kind person? <laughs> Everybody raises their hand, right? Uh, but but the, the question is, who are you kind to and at, uh, on what occasions? Yeah. Yeah. So, so there, there, is a, there is a fallacy that, that is developed in ourselves, uh, uh, you know, with any discipline, which is that, uh, you know, uh, 
just familiarity with the vocabulary does not imply that you're embodying those qualities. Yeah, totally, you know? totally. So that's why I try to steer away from like best practices mm -hmm. or, or competency models mm -hmm. around, around ethical framing of things. Yes. It really requires individuals yeah. to go through the change. Yeah, totally. Both, and, and I'm reminded of your disciplined compassion phrase from earlier, and yeah, making sure that yeah, it's actually being man manifested and embodied within right. ourselves. So, um, so with that, thank you so much for coming out. I, usually, when people end, uh, when I end podcasts, I tell them like, go check out their Twitter. But for you, what, <laughs> you know, do you have any next steps for any of my listeners if they want to either check out your the the the, the site that you know the ethical site or you know? Well, I mean. My encouragement will be check yourself out. <laughs> nice, is, nice, you know, nice. Disconnect for a while yeah, and, nice. and sit in silence nice. and stillness. Look nice. at the water or sky and yep. and just reflect a bit. Yeah. But uh, but if people want more information, they can just Google Ethics Initiative at MIT Media Lab or the Dalai Lama Center for Ethics. Very <laughs> sweet, perfect. Um, well, again, thank you so much, and thank you, listeners, for coming for listening today. Perfect. Thank you so much. Bye. Quite a setup. Uh, this thing, yeah. <laughs> Are you saying that it looks like we're we're working relatively well? Good. Do you mean do you mean that's quite a setup? Like it looks legit or not legit? No, it looks very legit. Oh, really? It looks very legit. It, uh, it's also very streamlined.